Hello, everyone. We are live here again tonight with episode 17 at Going to Bat with Team Irie. Uh, if you want to look at our schedule, some of the events we've already done, some of the interviews, you can look down through our Facebook page, foundation page, and check them out. And also, uh, we keep posting on some of the interviews we're getting ready to do. In the future, you can check all that out on our uh, foundation page. And also, whenever we're allowed to go back to having events, uh, we'll have them posted here and also on our website, dif35.org. And uh, we're re very happy tonight to have uh, Pat Darcy on here. We appreciate you being here tonight. Pat, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Good talking to you. Get on your show. Uh, great, great to have you here, Pat. And uh, we just kind of like start off the questions and, you know, we kind of want to know about your uh, baseball career, especially what you've done before the big red machine machine. If you don't care to kind of walk us through that. Okay, sure. I went to <clears throat> Rincon high school. We had a good baseball team and I was mainly an outfielder. I pitched in the summer. Some, I, you know, uh, threw a little bit in varsity with mainly outfield. And then I went to a junior college under, I played under Jim Brock, who went on and became a Hall of Fame coach at Arizona state. And I became just a pitcher then. And so scouts started watching me. And so I saw after my freshman year, I signed with Houston. And I went through their organization from rookie league to A ball, double A, triple A to the big league roster. And I got traded right before spring training in 74 for Dennis Menke. And it was a big adjustment for me because every team I played on it in the Houston Meyer league system finished last place. And so we had some good players. We always finished last place. So when you play on a last place team, you get, when you're pitching, you're always waiting for something bad to happen. You know? And so then I get traded to Cincinnati in their farm system, they, almost all those teams finished first place. So they were used to winning. So it took me a while to kind of get adjusted to, hey, we're going to win this game. You know, we're going to lose this game. Like that. You know, and Houston's philosophy was a lot different than since the Reds. Is that uh, in Houston, they say, okay, you're going to go to double A. If you struggle, we're going to stick with you. Don't worry about it. If you went to Cincinnati, if you struggle, we'll send you down to A ball. You know, and so, so we kept guys up there. They shouldn't have really went up there. And they would stick with them. And Houston had, I mean, they had a great farm system. They had, okay, Pat Gillick was the East Coast scout for Houston. And they had, Tal Smith was a, was one of the, the general manager. They had uh, uh, Jim Wilson, who ended up, he was one of the top scouts around. Jim Bomber was a scout. He signed me. He was a general manager of the Brewers and the Phillies. So they had all these great scouts. And they got great talent, but they just... You know, we just the, the, the philosophy of sticking with guys in the minor leagues, even though they were struggling, and it was it was you know you get used to losing all the time. But since then, I'll tell you this funny story: was that um, when I was at when I was at in, in Triple A, you could call your the farm farm director up and say, hey, "I'm pitching really good right now. I think I deserve a raise." They said, "What do you think you should get?" And I said, "Maybe like two hundred dollars more a month." And they, the guy said, "He said, oh sure, leave him a dollars." Oh sure, that's fine. So we're playing. So I'm in Indianapolis. So I'm pitching pretty good. We're on the road. And when you're playing the minor leagues, a lot of guys hang out in the same room together, you know. So we're all talking around. I said, Your guys call up, call up Chief Bender and ask for it. No, we'd never do something like that, you know. So I said, I'm going to call, I'm going to call him up and ask him. So they're all watching me. So I call Collect. The first thing he says is, Pat, never call me Collect again. <laughs> And so he goes, this is a Houston. I said, we're not talking about a raise now. Bye. <laughs> so all they're watching me. What did he say? How would it go? It didn't go very good at all. <laughs> but that's, it was, it was, that, that was, you know, Chief was a, Chief Bender was a tough guy, tough negotiator too. All those red guys were, you know, up there. They were, they were rough guys to deal with. But uh, I got to know Bob Housen pretty well. And we kept in touch. You know, he's, his, his son lives out in Phoenix, and he was he had a home in Scottsdale, a home in Denver. He's from Denver originally. And so I was on this committee when uh, we had Cleveland Indians down here for spring training. They were, they were leaving, going to Florida. And so we were looking for a team. And I call, I was on this committee to find a replacement team, and I called Bob Hausen up. And he said, okay, there are a group of people in Denver trying to get a baseball team. I'll follow that for you. And so a few months later, I get this call from this guy from Denver. He says, hey, I want to come out to fly out to, uh, to, to Tucson. I want you to show me the facility of the Indians. He says, Bob Housen told me to call you. 
and I became the point of contact. And after that, bringing the, the Rockies here to Tucson for spring training. And Bob and I stayed and he'd, he'd come down. We'd have lunch together, dinner together, something like that. Really a good guy. Really a good guy. And then how was it, uh, you know, you played for the Big Red Machine. You got the, over there in 74 and through 76. And what was that like playing for the Big Red Machine? Well, I got traded to Cincinnati about two days before spring training. And at Houston, you could have long hair and all that stuff, beard. They didn't carry and all that. And so I knew from playing, I played against them when in AAA. They, we were in Denver. They were in Indy. And so that's the only time I ever played against the Cincinnati minor league team. So I said, oh, oh God, I get my hair cut. So I get my hair cut. The first thing I go down there, Sparky wants to see me. And I said, I got my hair cut. It's not short enough. Get another, you need to get another haircut. And so, so just, and I get, get to know the guys, you know, Pete Rose, everyone was really nice, really nice to me and all that. It was like Jack Billy, man. You know, Gary Nolan was there. He's having arm problems still, but he was there and Joe was good. And they, you know, they had a bunch of Houston guys from, guys from Houston over in that team, you know, Geronimo and Billy Nam and Morgan, they all came over. So, you know, they were nice to me then because you know, we knew some of the same guys, stuff like that. So it was, it was interesting to camp. It was, you know, really good team. And I got sent down to Indianapolis, and our tri- Indianapolis team was was an amazing team. We had, you know, our, it was uh, we had Dave Reverend, Junior Kennedy, Doug Flynn, Ray Knight, Joaquin Andohar, Santo Akula, Pat Zachary, Will McEnany, Raleigh Eastwick, Joe Youngblood. I mean, it was a Roger, it was a solid team, really good ball club. Vern Rapp was our manager, kind of a tough guy, but I liked him. He was okay. But, you know, one thing about good, he's a real catcher. So Indianapolis, he's you know he let the grass go long in the infield. So the pitchers hit good ground balls out. They should be rewarded for it. Our hitters hated it, you know, because you, you couldn't hit the ball through the infield grass so high. But I like I like that. That was nice doing that. Yeah, we had a nice you know the field, the old field there. I think right now it's it, now they built I think they built into make it like a townhouse things around it, something like that. Because it had been a racetrack. You know they got now they moved it to uh, downtown Indy. <clears throat> our, our our radio announcer there was Howard Kelman. He's still doing the games. His first year is 1974. He's still broadcasting the Indian games. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, and you know, in 75, you started out on 11 and 5 record, three something ERA. And uh, I mean, you know, you won the last nine games of that year. I mean, you were on fire. Then you went into the World Series there. How did it? I mean, it had to be like living a dream uh, with nine wins in a row and, and all that going into the World Series. Yeah, it was. But it, it was interesting because. We had so many of the guys on the team that played in the World Series before, so they were kind of used to what's going on. So that wasn't that helped the young guys out some that uh, you know because you know, it it's totally different with all the media around and like that. And uh, so that those guys, those guys had been used to it. And it was you know we played you know we swept Pittsburgh and then we had the seven game series of Boston. So it was very interesting. And uh, I pitched in two games there, I pitched in game three. And then I came in in game six and pitched that game, you know, the last few innings of that game. So that was the game there. We were at six to three. It was weird. I'm sitting in the bullpen. If you're not pitching, you're in the bullpen in the World Series. And so I'm sitting in the bullpen thinking, man, my first full year in the major leagues, we're up six to three, two out in the bottom of the eighth inning. We're going to win this thing, you know. And Carver hits a three-run home. I go, I go from we're going to win this thing. I could be in this game, you know. So <laughs> sure enough, I went in, I came in in the 10th inning, and I remember – Dwight Evans, I see I, every now and then I'll, I'll see some clip of it. He would hit a hard hit ground ball, I knocked it down. He was by me. We were all the first place. He was by me. When I threw the, all I could see was Tony's glove sticking out, and I hit him right in the glove. I don't know how best I ever made my. I don't know how I ever did that. And after the play was over, Morgan comes running by. He, he comes in. He says, "You just made a great play." Ran back to his position. So that was that was we had. I pitched two strikes and he's there, <clears throat> and then Fisk hit the home run off the foul pole. In the I think it was bottom, the top of the I think the eleventh inning, yeah, it was the twelfth inning, yeah, bottom of the twelfth, I think it was something like that, yeah. So the home run there, and then we came back and won, won the next game. But it you know it was a great game that I didn't realize just till later on that the ball hit the foul pole and George Foster caught it <coughs> off the foul pole. He ended up selling it about 10, 15 years ago. I said, George, how can you convince him that was the ball? You know, yeah, it was, you know, but he no that didn't go out in the night, hit the foul pole. And, and Foster caught it and sold. I said, how many balls do you sell, Foster? <laughs> yeah, I sold 15 of them. But isn't the ball pissing out the poles? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, that was an iconic moment in baseball, of course, and you see that replay on every yeah. time. And, but, you know, it, it was good yeah. that you had another game there after that that you got to win. Yeah. But, 
you know, I know there's probably back in those days and stuff, it was kind of uh, a letdown for that to happen. But I mean, how I'm sure you've turned that around to a positive way of thinking. I mean, ever since then. Yeah, you know, the amazing thing about that series was, is that we got rained out. We flew back on Friday and uh, we practiced Friday. It, we, it rained Saturday, so everybody just, everybody just went, didn't do anything. We just left, you know, stay at the hotel. So Sunday, they got a bus and took it, you know, take us out to Tufts University. Well, the bus driver got lost. And so he got us in a general area. So we all have our uniforms on. And so Sunday, probably around noon, and we pull up the gas station, Sparky gets it out in his uniform on, goes up to the office, <laughs> everything just kind of froze, you know? So he gets the directions of tough. There's no security there. So we're in this field house and students are coming in, they're yelling, Louie, 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 TLS like that. That would never ever happen today. And then Monday we got rained out again. No one did anything. Today they'd be lifting weights, stretching, everything like that, find a field house. One day we practiced there and that was it. That would never happen now. You know, we'd have a lot of security all around all the time. But there are guys, you know, students that's coming and getting autographs, talking to you, stuff like that, or where people are playing, getting in the cages, stuff like that. Different yeah, we've times. Got, I don't know if you can see all this or not, but we've got people commenting over here. Brandon Walker, Mike Long, uh, he said it's showtime. John Holder is on here tonight. Uh, so blessed. He said thanks for uh, uh, for visiting with us, Mr. Darcy. So blessed to have grown up rooting for the debt, big red machine. You got Tom Posey here. It says, Welcome to show, Pat Tom Posey, Associate Scout, Chicago Cubs, Maysville, Kentucky. Kevin Gray, all the names are bringing back great childhood memories. He also said, in my opinion, the 75 World Series is still the best one of all time. 76 was a butt kicking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Vince likes to say that series. That's a series the Red Sox beat us three games to four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you do you get to keep up here? Yeah. yeah much anymore oh yeah i keep up with the guys yeah you know i thought i just uh text bench a few days ago about my golf clubs you know what kind of golf i need to get now like that but i see you know doug and eat raleigh and those guys a lot on facebook but mostly talk sometimes too so quite a few guys billy names like that so it's fun we, we still keep up it was a pretty close team yeah what's your uh you know you look back and you you know the world series and and playing for the big red machine is there a favorite memory that you have from those days? You know, I, I guess it would be, well, just, you know, playing on a, on a team like that. And then, you know, so things with Sparky, you know, the, the, the manager, how he handled everything. It really, you know, I, I, he was a good guy. You know, he didn't care for pictures that much, but I liked him. And, you know, we stayed in touch somewhat after his, after his career was over. But, uh, no, it was just we had a really good team. And really great team, and to be a part of that, but everybody pulled together, and uh, you know, just it was a team chemistry was was really really good. And as and far as all these superstars, to have a, have good chemistry, with all these future Hall of Famers on the same team. I know one of the questions somebody asked the other day when Doug Flynn was on here is, is how can you? Is there anything you can compare the World Series to, like in your life? Mm -hmm. What do, you, what do you say? Uh, he said, not really. I mean, he, you know, it's just a different story, but I didn't know if there's anything that, you know, you can compare that to in your life, like the World Series, living through that. You know, what would you even compare that to? You know, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, because you're, when you're a kid growing up, you know, you're not thinking about it. You know, once you're out there, the game, I'm pitching the World Series, you know, I'm pitching game three. I'm in the World Series, right? I can't believe it, you know. It's just something you, you watch on TV when you're growing up like that. Of course, back then there wasn't cable, so everybody watched the World Series. You know, there was those are the main games you get to, you get to watch the players, and so, and you know, all the teams and you're playing. It's almost banners around the, the stand, stuff like that. The grandstand. It's just like you're here. This is it, and it's pretty impressive. Yeah, and you know, everybody. You know, we talk about you lived that life, and a lot of us, of course, we never lived that life, and we always love to hear these stories. You get any? Good clubhouse stories you can share that's G rated. Well, I'll tell you this one. I was a bigger ball pitcher. So I you know, I didn't get I didn't get, get a lot of strikeouts. So I thought I come out this game. I think we're fishing against I was fishing against the Cubs. I started against the Cubs. And so I'm gonna throw four seam fastballs and get some strike. So I think I went like maybe one or two thirds innings and got taken out of the game, got yanked out of the game. So I, I'm in the I'm in the training room, ice my arm down, and Larry Shepard are Pitching coach comes in. He says, "You know, 
your ball wasn't moving like it usually does today. I said, I know. I was, I was still, still enforcing it fast. I like, you dumbass. And so no one said anything about it. So my next start, you know how they do it where you know, they the lineup, the first guy, Rose always, Pete Rose, Batty first, takes the field, you know, with the run home team. So I always went to the I always went to the mound early to work on the mound. And so I'm walking the mound, and Pete runs by me, says, no experiments today, okay, kid? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So, yeah, you know, Pete was such a. I remember one time, I, somebody Bobby he had to play in. He played, a, you know, for a guy coming in from left field to play third base on AstroTurf, where you get rockets it down to you. So Bobby Tolo was at the plate, and he had to play it because Bobby could run. And he had a line shot. We had a man on first about line shot right at Pete's head. They caught it. I don't know how, if they caught it, would have killed him. He had to caught it. So Pete he looks at first base and says, "I thought we might have a chance to throw a play, but ball hit so hard." The runner didn't have a chance to go off the base. <laughs> I said, thanks. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And, you yeah. know, a lot of us, of course, love Johnny Bench and Pete Rose both and all the guys from the Big Red Machine. Yeah. Of course, John Gullett lives here in the next county over, and uh, we have a lot of fun with those guys, and I'm sure you've had a lot of great memories with all those guys. Yeah, I remember my, my, my first start, I came up at the end of the year, I pitched against Atlanta. And the first inning, somebody hit a little chopper in front of the plate. And Bench, in my whole career, if I don't get that ball, it's a base hit. Before I get off the mound, Bench had the ball thrown to first base. That's how quick he was. It was amazing. Yeah. 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 And he had a reputation. No one ran on him either because, you know, he had a, so you have to hold the runners on that much because no one was going to run. So he was just, a, you know, outstanding defensive catcher. Yeah. Exactly. And you've got Mike Long here that wanted to know. He said, Pat, can you discuss – Sparky's philosophy, philosophy, use of pitchers, describe his style. <laughs> well, he like he would, use, he, you know, complete games, forget it. You know, he wanted, he was going to use the whole staff and he just come out, you know, take you out. That's it. You know, you, that's enough. You're, you're had, you had enough. And I went out. You're not supposed to talk to him when he comes up the mouth. If he asks you a question, you can answer that. You're not supposed to talk to him. So I thought I thought pitching against the, the Padres, whatever. So I thought I was throwing pretty good, you know. So he comes up the mound, and before he could raise his hand in the bullpen, I said, Sparky, he said, leave me and I feel good. And he grabs the ball and you'll feel a lot better in the shower. So <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so that's yeah, that. he's don't <laughs> it's just like you'll feel a lot better in the shower. I took me I took a ball in my hand. I went back and took a shower. <laughs> but oh, yeah. you know, but he had the we had a good bull, you know, everybody pitching that team. Oh, there wasn't like some guy didn't pitch that much. You know, we had a strong, you know, Clay Carroll, Bourbon, Eastwick, McEnany. Uh, those are, you know, that's a big time, big time bullpen there. And you got to thank so, him. Yeah. You had a great record in 75, and you were the fifth starter. I mean, what did I say about the other four? Yeah, they have, well, yeah, Billy Nam was, you know, Billy Nam, Jack Billy Nam, I don't think he ever missed a start. You know, he, he was just, he, you know, he, once every five days, he'd be out pitching. And Don Gullett, you know, he, he threw very well. Gary Nolan came back and, you know, I really, something about Gary amazing was that, uh, you know, he was a flamethrower when he first came up and he hurt his shoulder and he became a finesse pitcher and he was successful doing it. And uh, I'll I tell you, a funny story. We roomed together in spring training in 74, Gary and I did. And uh, my first year, you know, come with Reds. And so his shoulder bothered him for, for like two minutes, half of 72, half of 73. And they were getting rested. Everything's going to be okay now. And so he went out and his, his shoulder was hurting. So what the big thing back then, what they do is if you throw through the pain, you'll break the adhesions in your shoulder elbow. And everything's going to be okay. So so they shot him up with, with a, a painkiller, his shoulder, and he, he threw. I, I heard he threw pretty well. So everybody's pretty optimistic about it. So the next day, he woke up the next morning, he couldn't raise his arm up. And so they shot him up again a couple of days later, and I think he still told me he threw a ball like 30 feet, something like that. So they're going to send him out to Dr. Curlin, Cole, and uh, Joe, about these two doctors became, became superstar surgeons, you know, in, in baseball, Curlin and Joe. We're gonna sit, they're going to send him out there. So we go out to eat his last night in town. I said, and he's always worked out, you know, what if they can't find anything or what if it's really bad, all this like that. And I said, Gary, this is what's going to happen. When you wake up from surgery, the doctor's going to say, Gary, got some good news and some bad news. First, the good news, you'll never have a sore arm again. Now the bad news, you had to cut your arm off. And he'd use 
<laughs> so the next time I see him, he came down in Indianapolis back in, like in July, you know, just to hang, just hang out, get the fuel, get through a little bit on the side. And he comes over, you know, right before you put me under, I started thinking of what you told me. <laughs> he said, I started cussing at you. <laughs> but he came back, he, you know, he was he finesse for this picture. He came back and did it. Yeah. Oh, really, yeah. Really, really amazing what he did. Yeah. Exactly. I see where uh, Mike also mentions his Sparky was ahead of his time with his use of the bullpen. You know, he thought that Sparky done a great job with his use of the bullpen. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Now more, you know, we have 10 pitchers. Now they now sometimes they have 13 pitchers on the staff now. Yeah, so, Kevin Gray was asking back in those days, who was the hardest hitters for you to get out? These are the guys that just try to make the contact with the ball, you know, like you know, go the other way with the ball. Those because I, you know, being a sinker ball pitcher, you know, they're going to go go the try to pull you, you know, go the other way. Those guys like that were tough. Any, you know, major league hitters though, you know, they're you make a mistake on something, they're going to hit the ball hard someplace too. So, uh, but you know, a lot of a lot of you know, National League has some really good teams too. And then our big rival the Dodgers. That was the Dodgers yep. had a good team too. Yeah, I was going to say, was there any particular person? batter that you hated to face you know a lot of them were kind of tough because you had like line drives you know up the middle all the time like that you had to be ready for that a pittsburgh but you know you just no, you just throw your game you know if you start thinking about that you won't go out you won't want to pitch you start thinking about someone hitting the ball back at you you know you're not going to be able to do it so you're not going to follow through right so you just got to just forget about it and go 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 out and pitch if you get hit you get hit it's you just funny. Don't on your face you know? It, it's funny you mentioned Al Oliver because me and Al's good friends. Uh, when I broke my neck 30 years ago, Al was the first one to come to the hospital to see me. And, and right after oh, really? he started baseball, and we've been friends ever since. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's a good, really good hitter. Line drive hitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you've played a lot of, you know, ball down there with the Cincinnati Reds and stuff. And Joe Morgan, I met him a couple years ago, which, Joe was a nice guy, and he was a heck of a hitter back then, too. He, Joe was a really smart hitter. Really, He used to have a little notebook pad in the clubhouse. After every game, he'd write down every pitch that guy threw him where it went. He, like, have a, instead of a computer, he had a little notebook there. Every day, every game, he did that. He was And he he, he was nice to me because we both came over. He was with Houston, too. And uh, I had got to know Jimmy Wynn. Was a, the toy cannon was over at Houston when I was there coming up. In, so he was nice. So he, Joe really – Helped me out really nice to me when I was up there just because of being over Houston. Yeah, and you had uh, really – we were talking about Don Gullett a little earlier. They used to say that Don Gullett could throw so hard he could throw it through a car wash and never get the ball wet. Probably so, yeah. He could, he could, crank, he could crank it up there, yeah. <laughs> right over the top, too. Yeah, Yeah, I think yeah, Willie Stargill yeah. – I think Bob Bryson said Willie Stargill was the one that came up with that quote, and then they said that uh, – Pete Rose told him that uh, uh, when he came to every time he went to pitch, they should play the song "Blue by You." <laughs> there you go, huh? <laughs> yeah, Donnie Gola, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and then after baseball, you've uh, you've been in real estate and stuff here for the last so many years, right? Yeah, commercial real estate. I'm active with uh, with, with the city. In the county, you know, we have. Uh, I said I was a, a point point of contact with bringing the Rockies here, and uh, the Parks Commission, and also the Peter County Sports Hall of Fame. We have that the banquet coming up. Hopefully, now that we had a the coronavirus doesn't affect it, but uh, so it's it's really it's you know getting involved with things. So family, my family's all grown up now, and uh, still married off my my wife, of course, like that. But it's just you know you grew up here, and it's a, it's a nice place to live. Yeah, and you was into politics there a little bit. Uh, ran for mayor a couple of times. Was, people want, one time, people want me to run again, to do something like that, but it's just hard to do. You know, especially like a young family then. You're gone all the time because you have a job. It's really, it really tough to do that. Because you're just exhausted doing it, running around like that. But uh, I thought about doing it again, just, but uh, I don't know. We'll wait and see what happens. And do you ever get a chance to come so, back to Cincinnati any? I have been. I was there a couple of years ago. You know, I often all we have you know shows back there, and I, we do that uh, 
the fantasy camp up here up, up in Goodyear. I do that sometimes. So yeah, I get to like by going up there, you get to know some of the other players that you know are a lot younger than we we are, and get to meet some of those guys too. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, my nephew Brandon there. He said that the '75 '76 Cincinnati Reds uniform was his favorite Reds uniform of all time. So you know that that's pretty good, and everybody likes the retro uh, Reds uniform, especially when they had them here last year and played them. Yeah. Yeah. Those. <laughs> Yeah, with polyester uniforms, yeah. <laughs> they probably wasn't too cool back then, or was they? When there was like a ninety-five degree humid day, they probably kind of stuck to you, didn't they? It could be humid, yeah. It could be humid, since that's for sure, yeah. Hot and humid, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly, but uh, yeah, we appreciate you being on here tonight, and, and uh, you know we're getting around the thirty-minute mark, and I know you're a busy man, and you'll probably uh, sell a few more uh, pieces of real estate before the day is over with. I know how busy you are out there, but. We sure appreciate you being on the show, and uh, and uh, you know we uh, sure like the '75, '76 big red machine, and it's been an honor to talk to you. Okay, thank you, David. I appreciate it. All right, thanks for inviting me on the show. All right, and holler back at me anytime. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll see you. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.